a little sip of the frappe to get things rolling. Gonna need a little bit of extra energy for today's episode because we got a big one lined up. UFC 270, we got one of the biggest heavyweight matchups of all time taking place. Francis Ngannou taking on Cyril Gaon. Friends turned... I don't know if we would say enemies, but a little bit of bad blood. We'll save the enemies for Colby Covington and Jorge Masvidal when we get into all that. Uh, but it's a big-time matchup. Besides that fight, we got a lot of intriguing matchups all throughout the card. You guys know what time it is. Strap in your seatbelts. Uh, buckle your boots up. Uh, tie them up if you don't got a buckle on your boots. Some of you guys have boots with, with no buckles on them. Uh, whatever you guys got to do, get ready for a big-time episode. I'm excited for it. Let's get into it. It's another day, yeah. left jab, right jab, this is MMA, MMA. Mixed martial arts, quick body parts, undefeated when I pick a mood of champ Who the victim looking in my crystal ball, I predict the winner yeah. Never stop fighting, if you lose, keep your chin up keep your chin Know up. how the game go, I'm a small fella uh -huh. Welcome to the show, this the MMA fortune teller yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. What is up, you guys? UFC 270, Francis Ngannou taking on Cyril Gaon. I am so excited for this matchup. I cannot wait to see how it takes place. Uh, I, I love the whole story between these two guys, how they have trained together. Uh, they, they had uh, the same coach back in the day. Things have changed. I love the whole storyline. Uh, but more importantly, it's the skill set that both these men bring into the octagon. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. Uh, this may be the the highest caliber of a heavyweight matchup that we've ever seen. Um, it's certainly right up there with, with Francis versus Stipe. Uh, Cyril Gaon is a guy that still needs to prove himself a little bit more. But this is a guy that shows to have more potential than just about anybody I've ever seen come through the division. So uh, this is going to be an amazing fight one way or another. Uh, we'll be getting into that here in a little bit. Uh, you guys know the routine with the show. We got to recap this past weekend's event. And, uh, you know, the UFC gave us a little appetizer. And now we got the main course taking place this upcoming weekend. I know that you guys were all very excited for the fights that took place last Saturday after not having action for such a long period in time. Uh, but don't get it twisted. Uh, this upcoming weekend is what it's really about. 2022 is kicking off this upcoming Saturday with an amazing event, UFC 270. Um, you guys, if you could, please do go follow me on social media. Go give me a follow on Instagram, MMA Fortune Teller underscore. Like this video. Subscribe if you guys haven't already. Uh, especially, you know, also also catch me on Twitter too, the MMA Teller. But especially catch me on Instagram. It's it's really the best way to keep up with me. Uh, I'm I'm on the story there, and um, you know I'm on the story all the time during the fights. And also, uh, I'm posting a lot of a lot of different content that I don't always post here on YouTube. So, uh, for example, you know, fighters to keep an eye on. I had a, a little video I put out on the day of the fights, and I wanted you guys to make sure you were were keeping a special eye on Brandon Royval and Calvin Cater. Coincidentally, they both came through, but. Again, we're gonna we're gonna recap uh, Cater uh, versus Chikazi. Um, trying to think if there's anything we need to run uh, by you guys real quick. Also, oh yeah, you guys, real quick, comment below if any of you guys have a good recommendation uh, for a name of an MMA clothing line. If you guys have any recommendations, comment below. Uh, I, I have some things I'm working on right now. I'm planning on starting uh, as some type of clothing line, clothing apparel uh, in regards to MMA. If anybody has a really good name, if you guys comment, comment it below and I do end up choosing it, I definitely will hook you guys up with some stuff. So uh, of course, just comment that below. If you guys see who, what name I pick, which I will be announcing over the next couple of weeks, if it was you that, that put it in the comment section, make sure you just let me know or I'll message you. And and I want to hook you up with some stuff, uh, whether I'm sending you some stuff, free merch, when I start getting all these shirts and whatnot, uh, some free plays, or even if I just shoot you uh, a little bit of cash through Venmo or whatever. So comment below if you guys got any ideas. And uh, with no further ado, we're going to take a look back at last weekend's card. And uh, it, I'll let you guys know right now, it was pretty much a stalemate. And, and we'll get into all that now. Let's go. So fight night, Calvin Cater versus Giga Chikazi. Uh, we had six official plays throughout the card. Which I will clarify, um, I did have two plays 
that were in regards to one specific fight, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to. Um, TJ Brown takes out Charles Rosa. Uh, we start things off down, but it was a very small play. I, I did take a stab on Charles Rosa, a 1.5 unit play. Uh, yeah, I felt that if Charles had a full fight camp, maybe he would have even performed better. He had some moments there, uh, you know, going for some chokes and whatnot. But TJ Brown well, was looking sharp, and he, he took care of business in that fight. So shout out to TJ Brown. Um, you know, it was what it was. Brian Kelleher uh, takes out Kevin Kroom. I think we all kind of uh, saw that fight going that way. Kelleher's been working on his wrestling. Kroom uh, does lack cardio a little bit and does lack uh, some strength in, in, in wrestling. And uh, it does affect him at times. So he wasn't able to keep the fight at distance and use his range. And Kelleher comes through. And in my opinion, Kelleher gets another layup. Uh, Kelleher, Kelleher has had many layups um, now, his initial opponent, I told you guys, I did have a play in his initial opponent, uh, Kakramanov, who I think would have took care of business. Uh, but again, Kelleher, luckily enough, somehow ends up getting an, an, another easy opponent. Uh, I hate to say it like that, but it's kind of true. You know, one of the lower level fighters in the UFC, take a look at Kelleher's resume. He has a, a couple of those. Um, Court McGee takes, on, takes out Ramiz Brahimaj. You can't count this guy Court out, man. He's up there in age, but this guy is just a savage. And a big shout-out to Court McGee. I, I do admire watching him do his thing. And um, and then we go to the next fight. Uh, we do take another L here. This one was the most uh, frustrating play for me that, that I lost here because I, I knew not to touch this, and I did add it as a last-minute play. And uh, I'll tell you why, but I, I did take... Uh, Joseph Holmes was a three-unit play over Jamie Pickett. It was a little bit more so of a fade on Jamie Pickett. Uh, I felt th that he does show holes at times. He's vulnerable to be hit. I thought Joseph Holmes would have been a little bit more, uh, a little bit more precise with with his striking. He did, he didn't really show to be the most athletic fighter throughout throughout watching tape on him. Uh, but you hear James Krause talking about big big things to come from him and that he's ready for the big step up to the UFC. You hear everybody else chirping about this guy, Joseph Holmes. And the back of my mind the entire time, I'm like, I don't know what these people see. And I'm kind of laughing at some of these people shooting me messages and whatnot. But I kind of, I, I fell into the trap as well. And I, you know, I, at the end of the day, I was like, you know what, man? Holmes is going to come through. I'm going to collect some units on that fight. Should have stayed away from it. And uh, as you guys saw, Holmes struggled with his cardio once again, just really not that impressive inside the cage. So um, I learned my lesson there, and it's it's it is what it is. I took an L. Now in this next fight, I had a four unit play on Joe Anderson Brito. Uh, lost that as well, as you guys see. I'm stringing off these losses, but stick with me. We're gonna we're gonna run the table for the rest of the card. Uh, but you know what? I stand behind this play. I liked what I saw on tape. I thought Brito would have been a little bit uh, more of the, the stronger opponent. And I thought he would have got some some takedowns, solidified some some rounds there. I've seen Algio. I've seen Algio struggle before with his wrestling and, and being put down on his back uh, within many of rounds within fights that have, that have cost him fights. Uh, but he, Bill, here, Bill Algio looked very sharp. His cardio was definitely superior than Brito's. And uh, I take that L right on the chin. Now, we had a five-unit play on uh, Vyacheslav Borishov to take out Dakota Bush. He gets the finish there. Uh, you guys know I'm high in this guy, Borishov. I like that he's training with Team Alpha Male. I like uh, a lot of the, the X-Factors that were going into this fight here. Dakota Bush, I'm not that high on. I think Borishov has some real, real nasty striking. So I was all over them, him there. I got him at minus 180, got it nice and early, collected some nice units there. And then... The last two plays here, uh, I was all over Caitlin Chikogian. Essentially, it was a max play on Caitlin. It was two separate plays. I had a five-unit play on her to win the fight at minus 170, and I had a three-unit play on Caitlin Chikogian to win via decision at minus 120. Um, now, in retrospect, I should have just hammered that, that decision line. I should have cut out some of those other plays. But at the end of the day here, we, we go three out of six, and we lose 0.2 units on the card. 0.2 units, not two units. Okay, 0.2 units, um, which is basically nothing. It was a stalemate of a card. It is what it is. Keep in mind, I started off last year, 2021, going 0 for 3 on, on the card. Uh, I had to play in Calvin Cater, ironically enough, and against Holloway. But I go 0 for 3 on that card, and you guys know what I did throughout the rest of the year. So this is nothing. Basically a stalemate for the first event of the year does not phase me here. Uh, I think, in fact, we're, we're just getting things going here, and I'm very excited for what we have to come. Uh, Brandon Royval, a play that I was very close to taking. I didn't take it, though. Royval gets the split decision over Bontaran. Jay Collier, another play I was flirting with, man. I didn't pull the trigger. Uh, I was a little... I don't like the fact that Collier gained all that weight. Sometimes I think he's a little unprofessional. I was listening to some of his interviews, and I, I didn't have... Uh, the courage to side with him there, even though I thought he was a superior fighter. You guys know I picked these guys here. And then in the main event, 
I definitely want to clarify something here. You guys know I picked Giga to win the fight. No, no question about it. But you guys, run the tape back. I got the timestamps. I tried to warn you guys not to take this as a bet. Um, if you guys listen to what I said, I said everybody's disrespecting Calvin Kadar. The line is way too high on Giga. Calvin's a nasty fighter. He has great boxing, great stand-up. He's a, he's a war horse. He's a warrior. He's all that. And uh, I thought there was some potential for him to... to to pull off this fight. But at the end of the day, yes, I had Giga winning this fight for sure. I thought Giga was just going to be too much with his kicks and in his striking. Um, but I, I mean, if you guys even go to my Instagram and see my fighters to watch video, I even shined up a little bit about what, what cater brings to the table as well. And, uh, I think that was a fight that you had to leave alone at that line at minus two fifty. And in retrospect, the value was on cater, but, uh, that, that wasn't a play. I wasn't going to be taken. I would not be taking cater there. He burned me last year against max. You guys know I'm extremely high on giga. I wasn't touching him there. So that's why I just avoided the fight. Uh, but that, that's going to wrap up UFC fight night, cater versus Chikazi. Uh, like I said, I'm very excited just to move forward and, and have a big, big card this upcoming weekend for UFC 270. So here it is taking place this upcoming Saturday, January 22nd, taking place in Anaheim, California, it's the big show. Uh, we got the big main event fight, of course, of Nganu and Gone. Moreno versus Figueroa. We got the trilogy fight taking place. A lot of exciting fighters all throughout this card. Big time prospects. Uh, Syed Nurmagomedov, uh, Michelle Pajeda, always fun to watch. Rodolfo Vieira, an interesting fighter. Uh, Michael Morales is a guy who's 12-0. He had a, a big time performance on Dana White's Contender Series. Gennaro Valdez may have had the most exciting fight that ever has taken place on Dana White's Contender Series. Uh, he's also undefeated in the training partner of Brandon Moreno's. Uh, it, just a lot of exciting fights, man. We'll see if the Hione Barcelos versus Victor Henry fight actually goes through this time on the card. Uh, Ilya Taporia, 11-0, big time prospect. Uh, Vanessa Demopoulos also. Let me not brush over her. She's she's an interesting fighter. And then Jack Della, uh, Madalena versus Pete Rodriguez. And that's where we're going to start things off here. Taking place in the welterweight division. Jack Della, Madalena taking on Pete Rodriguez. Jack had a great performance on Dana White's Contender Series uh, a while back, a few months back. Uh, he, he was taking on a very tough customer, a training partner of Gilbert Burns and Ange Lusa who is a, a nasty striker and a fighter that's working on his overall game. And Jack showed up in a major way in that fight. Uh, Jack is a guy that switches stances very fluidly. He's a solid striker, comes in in phenomenal shape, uh, very well-rounded. He can grapple. He could do it all. Okay, this is a guy that's also only 25 years old. And uh, this, this is a guy that you might see down the line uh, being a fighter that, that kind of holds the, the flag up for Australia. I mean, this, this is a guy that really might be one of the top fighters fighting out of Australia in the next four years. I think he has that type of potential as some of those uh, other Aussie fighters start to age. This is uh, the, the, the next generation, in my opinion. Um, still has a lot to prove, but there's potential there. I'm telling you guys. Um, now he takes on this guy, Pete Rodriguez. Pete Rodriguez, only 4-0. Um, I'm very, very surprised to see this guy get the call up. Uh, four professional fights, all, all uh, finishes. And this is a guy that that looks decent, but doesn't have a lot of experience. Uh, you could have saw some of his fights on Fight Pass as of recently. Um, and if you looked at some of his opponents, I'm going to tell you right now. Um, you take a look at his fight against uh, Jose Luis Rios, who was, uh, I believe he might have been 1-0 at the time as well. But uh, that fighter is not on the level. Uh, very elementary striking. But at the end of the day, I was decently impressed with Pete Rodriguez. This is a guy that, that carries some power, and he looks to have some, some pretty good boxing um, going for him. So this is a guy that can definitely starch people. So even though he's coming in, coming in uh, a little bit less experienced, uh, when you're un when you're inexperienced, but you got nasty hands. I mean, if you land, you could put anybody out. So let's understand that first and foremost. He's coming into this fight as a dog. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that now. I mean, almost a plus two forty, um, and we will pull up the live line just to see how that's going right now. And uh, Pete Rodriguez. Uh, right around a plus 225 on FanDuel. We see him here up to the plus 250 range uh, on certain books. And um, this is an interesting fight. Uh, as far as their stature, both of them have a 73-inch reach. Uh, Pete a little bit shorter, so nothing really going on there. Both these guys only 25 years old. Uh, Jack just has uh, more professional experience. Uh, he also has the, the benefit of already participating in a big-time fight. Uh, fighting in Dana White's Contender Series, obviously, I don't, I don't think anything that Pete did fighting on UFC Fight Pass and one of those smaller events has, um, has the same um, the type of uh, comparability, I guess you would say, to a, a fight like this. I, I put more stock into a fight like this 
um, that that Jack had against a guy in Angelus. Uh, so a little bit more going on for for Jack there as well. Uh, but but let's get to the nitty gritty. How do we see these guys squaring off when push comes to shove? I, I think that that Jack is. Uh, gonna entertain some striking exchanges. I think that he's more than comfortable there in the feet. I like the way he switches stances. I think that he will be the more di diverse striker. I like the body kicks that he throw that he throws. I think Pete will be a little bit more um, a little bit more leaning on his hands. He'll be looking to to catch Jack with a counter shot with the hands. Try to get another knockout. I'm sure that Pete is expecting to go in there and get another knockout. When you go in there, you fight four times and you're starching these guys. That's what you're expecting to do. Uh, every time you go in there and especially from a guy like Pete, this is a guy that doesn't seem to be lacking any type of confidence from what I've seen from the guy. All right. So, uh, but at the end of the day, I think that he might, um, he, he might be, I don't want to say that he's going to be in over his head, but I think that this is a major step up in competition. So I think reality is going to hit him a little bit. And I am leaning uh, Jack to win the fight. I think that Jack has more things going for him here, but I am very interested to see, how the the four and O fighter uh, Pete uh, will perform here, uh, Pete Rodriguez. Again, you don't see a lot of guys get the opportunity to fight in the octagon with a record like this, so this is intriguing here. Uh, I got Jack Della uh, Madalena to win the fight, and another X factor too is I feel like I've seen more from Jack in regards to his grappling uh, on tape as well. So I do know that that he he is a solid grappler. He has good jujitsu. He's scrappy there on the mat as well. So I lean more for. I lean more towards his side there as well. So uh, Jack Della Medellina to win the fight, in my opinion. As far as the line goes, uh, you know, again, it's a decently high line. He is the superior fighter from what I see, but there's a lot of question marks here. There's a lot of unknowns. We don't really have, uh, a, we don't really have a concrete idea of who Pete Rodriguez is. You know, Pete Rodriguez might be, end up being a guy. That's a stud, and he might prove that time and time again down the line. So um, I'll roll with Jack, though. Ilya Taporia taking on Charles Jordan. Uh, Charles Jordan has a, a full plate in front of him this upcoming Saturday. I don't know if he's going to be able to to finish it off, man. I think that this is a, this is a big test in front of him. Ilya Taporia, one of the more, I guess I shouldn't say more underrated fighters, even though he is officially not ranked right now. Uh, in the featherweight division, if you go to the UFC website and you go to the, the rankings, you will not see him in the top 15, uh, which is somewhat understandable for the fact that he's only had uh, three fights within the octagon, takes out Yusuf Zalal, takes out Damon Jackson, and then he gets the nasty knockout over Ryan Hall. Uh, but if you're somebody like me who likes to gravitate towards certain fighters where I see promise from, if I'm a believer in the skills I see, even if it's a limited amount of fights. I'm, I'm willing. To, I'm more so willing to attach myself to them. You've seen me do this with guys like Cyril Gaon. Um, you could name a bunch. Uh, Magomed and Kalayov. Uh, there's a lot of guys that I've I've gravitated towards uh, throughout the years. And for the most part, I would like to say that I'm pretty good w when I do that. Uh, if I see real promise, you know, Kamzat Chimaev. Not that a lot of you guys didn't do that as well, but there's nothing wrong with jumping on that train early. Ilya Taporia is a guy that I'm doing that for, um, which is kind of funny because his initial opponent, Mosar Ev Evlevoyov, is another guy that I gravitated towards who I feel is going to be a big-time fighter in the division for years to come. Now, Mosar had to pull out of this fight, so in steps Charles Jordan, taking the fight on short notice. He did have a, a decent heads-up, though. Um, this fight was, was put together here for a little bit now. Not too long, but... Um, uh, stylistically, Charles Jordan. Let, let's let's talk about him for a second here. Charles Jordan, his, his bread and butter is his striking. He's a technician on the feet. Very very technical. Um, put, put on a clinic in his last fight against Andre Ewell. Really looked good in that fight. Um, you know, you, you take a look at his fight against uh, Julian Arosa. Started off strong, kind of faded in that fight a little bit. Showed to have some holes in his game. Ended up getting uh, finished there. He got Dars choked. That was only four months ago. Uh, looked great against Marcelo Rojo. Got the finish there. Uh, the Joshua Koulibau fight. That was a fight where he started slow. Lost that first round, but then uh, lost that first round 10 to 8. But then it ended up putting two very solid rounds together to get the draw there. Um, so also, do sh he does show to have heart. You know, a lot of guys, when, when you get beat down 10-8, to 8, it's very tough to, to come back there and win the next two rounds. Uh, but again, Charles Jordan is a guy that is very technical on the feet. I think that he could pretty much hang there with anybody. But the difference here is Ilya Taporia is a guy that carries a lot more power, 
Um, this guy is just a, a brutal fighter. Goes by the nickname El Matador. Uh, this is a guy that likes to close the distance, throw, throws heavy hands on you, heavy shots. Charles Jordan is a guy that doesn't really like to be pressured. He kind of he's willing to engage in, in uh, somewhat of a brawl, but for the most part, he likes to have that distance. He likes to throw his kicks and uh, likes to, likes to fight at range. Uh, both these guys are going. They're both going to have a 69 inch reach, so identical reach here. Even though Jordan's two inches taller, so nothing really going on there. I. I edge Ilya big time in regards to the power. I think if Ilya lands, there's, there's going to be a big difference. You're, you're going to you're going to feel the impact of his shots much more than Jordan. Jordan will will look for uh, that 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 technical and, and sharpshooter type of punch. Maybe he could try to touch the chin. Maybe he could do something special there. But I wouldn't bank on that. Uh, I think Ilya is going to have an advantage in the strength department when these guys clinch up when they grapple. I could expect Ilya. To, to be on top in, in those types of positions. Um, this guy's a specimen here. And um, I, I'm, I'm a big believer in him. I, I'm excited to see him uh, take take the step up in, in competition against some of these guys. And Jordan is, is somewhat of that, right? I mean, if you take a look at his last fights, Ryan Hall, the wizard, he's a different type of fighter, right? And, and in that fight, we, we saw Taporia get that nasty knockout. He was very calm and composed. He avoided those Eminari rolls and all that and, and shut his lights out. We saw the power. Uh, but this is a different type of test. Uh, Damon Jackson, a very tough fighter, knocked him out as well. You guys know I, I, I do believe Damon's a tough outing. And then the victory over Yusuf Zalal. Uh, Charles Jordan uh, is going to have uh, better striking than all three of those opponents that he has faced in the octagon so far. So I'm interested to see how they match up on the feet. Uh, I'm siding with Taporia. Again, you guys know I'm high on Taporia here. So we take a look at the live line. And uh, we're going to have Taporia right now. Let's see if I can pull this up for you guys. We had the initial matchup here of Taporia and Movsar, which he was uh, right around a minus 135, which is it was pretty interesting. And then now with the new matchup here, Ilya versus Charles Jordan, he is uh, right around that minus 500 range. Uh, up to the minus 550 depending on what book you're working with so he's a big time favorite here it, it's somewhat interesting because charles jordan is a very very competent opponent very capable uh, but i think that a lot of people will be in agreement that taporia is is going to be their pick in this fight and people are expecting big things from him and uh, that will be my pick Ilya taporia the the georgian uh fighter fighting out of spain as well shout out to the, the georgians out there the spaniards all them and uh this is a big time fight all right, so guys, these next two fights, Vanessa Demopoulos versus Silvana Gomez Juarez and Hayoni Barcelos versus Victor Henry. I just recently broke down both of these fights in past episodes. Uh, the Vanessa Demopoulos, I think it was supposed to be in the last card. Uh, the Hayoni Barcelos versus Henry fight was recent too. I'm going to have, uh, in the by where the timestamps are in the description, I will have the links to those episodes with the timestamp and all that for you guys. Um so you guys can go to those previous videos and you guys can pull it up. I'll have all the information. So if you guys want to see my predictions on those fights, once again, they will be there for you. Just a click away, guys. Don't be too lazy uh, to, to just move your wrist a little bit and press your finger down. If you guys are looking to work with me for this big fight card coming up, UFC 270, or for the rest of the year, for all these cards we have lined up, shoot me a message. I'll send you over my pricing. Uh, don't hesitate. If you guys are just curious, whatever you know, you're wondering, shoot me a message, man. I'd love to catch up with you guys. I will send you over my pricing. You guys can take it into consideration. Uh, but you just know that if you work with me and you, you pay for my services, I have a proven track record that it will pay off for you guys. I've done it time and time again. Stick to this system, and you're gonna. It's gonna benefit you. You're gonna make money working with me, uh, with my official plays. All right, guys. So I'm always here. I'm available. All right, guys. Jasmine. Just a Davikius taking on Kay Hansen. Two very promising fighters. Uh, Kay Hansen's going to be 10 years younger. That's something to keep an eye on here. Uh, but although Jasmine is, is significantly older, she only has seven professional fights. So Kay Hansen with four more professional fights. Jasmine did get in the game late. So I guess you could still consider her as... as you can group her with some of those younger prospects, which if you guys catch me on Instagram, I'm going to be working on a post here for later today in regards to some of these these young women fighters that have been working their way uh, in the UFC over the past couple of years. Some of them are very promising, and Kay Hansen is definitely one of them. Uh, there's a, a solid five or six fighters that I've been very intrigued to see uh, working their way into the octagon and one of those fighters also was uh, Kay Hansen's last opponent opponent in Corey McKenna 
Um, you, you know, you got girls. Um, you, you got a lot of promising female fight, fighters. Um, Casey O'Neill, I believe her name is, fighting out of Scotland. Another one that's very, very promising. Um, names, some of these names aren't ringing but bell to me right now. Are They're not popping into my head. But uh, you guys know a lot of these girls I'm talking about. The fighter that just took out uh, Miranda Maverick. Of course, her name's slipping my mind right now. Um, but either way, you guys know what I'm talking about, man. And I will have a post in regards to those fighters. So go check that out. It will be on Instagram later today. Now back to this fight. Kay Hansen taking on Jasmine, uh, Jessa Davikius. Jasmine, uh, she had that victory in her last fight over Julia Palestri. Took fight on Dana White's Contender Series. She goes out in the first round, takes down her opponent, controls that round. In the second round, starts to struggle a little bit with the takedowns and actually ate a big head kick shot. Probably loses that second round. She does lose that second round. And then... Uh, the fight comes down to the third round, and she's having a little bit of adversity in the beginning of the third round, not getting that takedown again, but eventually does get a, a takedown towards the later half of that round, solidifies that round, and gets the victory. She showed to have a lot of heart. She's a tough cookie. She likes to likes to wear on her opponents, try to do those little inside trips and, and, and take her opponent down. Was not that impressed from what I've seen from her on the feet. Uh, I think more so the strengths of, of her are her, her heart and her toughness, uh, and, and she comes in in good shape. Um, Kay Hansen, on the other hand, this, this girl's a stud here. Like I said, only 22 years old. Uh, I think she has that, that jud judokian background. She's, she's very strong hips. Her, her striking is coming around. She's a very well-rounded fighter. Um, you got a lot of you guys remember the story as she made her UFC debut against Jin Yu Frey. Somebody had a big time bet on her. Uh, she started that fight off slow, loses the first round, but then she starts to pick things up and she ends up getting the, the submission victory there. Um, Loses her last fight to Corey McKenna. That was a very tough fight. I am very high on Corey McKenna. So uh, if you guys are looking into that loss there, understand that Corey is a very talented fighter as well. Um, and, and with the age of K here at 22, you're going to have to understand there's going to be major strides in her game over the next couple of years. And I expect to see major strides from this fight, or excuse me, from the last fight to this fight. Uh, when a fighter like that comes off a loss, I know that that was extremely motivating for her. It's going to be over a year since that fight, so she's had plenty of time to work on her craft. I'm expecting big things from, from K here. And um, this should be a fight that she should be able to handle here. Now, she will be at a five-inch reach disadvantage. She will be the, the significantly shorter fighter, but that's nothing really new from her. Um, that, that's kind of the way she's built. But she's a tough cookie, and like I said, she has very strong hips. Um, she, she's a, a powerful, powerful girl. And um, this is a fight that, that I, I'm definitely leaning her way here. Uh, like I said, Jasmine didn't really impress significantly in that victory on Dana White's contender series. She, she did some things well, but I think stylistically K is going to be, uh, is, she's going to be able to fare very well against Jasmine, right? Uh, I think K will have no problem stuffing those takedowns. I really do. I believe that she'll be able to keep the fight on the feet. We seen Jasmine uh, eat some big shots there. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if K is able to tag her up with some big shots on the feet as well. There'll be some potential there. Look at Kendra Lust in the comment section. Uh, big MMA fan. I'm sure some of you guys are Kendra Lust fans. Not personally, not really. Um, I'm not really the biggest fan of her work. Um, I don't know if any of you guys frequently tune into her work, but uh, I know some better ones than, than Kendra Lust. But uh, back to the fights over here. And speaking of Kendra Lust, look at this. Kay Hansen, man, very physically fit. She says she's glowing here. And again, she is part of that new wave of young women uh, coming to the U coming into the UFC and coming on to the the MMA scene in general that that are really looking to shine. Um, we're gonna take a look at the live line here, and we're gonna see that Kay Hansen is right around uh, from anywhere from a two thir minus two thirty all the way up to like a minus two seventy five. So she's a, a decently hefty favorite here. Um, you guys know I do feel a lot of times these women's fights can play out closely when you have a fighter like Jasmine who is extremely tough don't be shocked if she makes this fight play out closer than some of you guys expect and don't be don't be shocked if she's able to sneak off a victory but at the end of the day you break down tape on these two girls Kay Hansen is the superior fighter in my opinion and she she has some some avenues to to really uh, to to do some things in this fight to to land some big shots like I said, Jasmine lacking a little bit with the striking defense, gets a little bit too caught up in trying to get the fight down to the ground sometimes, kind of exhausts herself. She has a lot of things she needs to work on. And again, even though she's older, she doesn't have that much professional experience. So she's still learning 
as she's going through things too. So she's learning how to pace herself and whatnot. And I'm sure she learned a lot from that last fight that, that, that she just won. That was a really close fight, right? I'm sure she learned a lot from that fight as well. Uh, at the end of the day though, uh, I, I do side with Kay Hansen. Um, but, um, keep an eye uh, on Jasmine and Jasmine. She has the look and all that too, man. Uh, but at the end of the day, the looks, the looks and all that aren't going to be enough, uh, for, for you to, to go in there and get W's. You got to go in there, perform, go in there and perform. And I'm very interested, uh, to see how, how she can perform here against Kay Hansen. So Kay Hansen will be my pick. Keep an eye on this fight. This should be a fun one. Tony Gravely taking on Simon Oliveira. Tony Gravely coming off a very, very tough loss in his last fight. And uh, you, you talk about the, the ups and downs of, of fighting in mixed martial arts. And you talk about Tony Gravely's last two fights. Gets a big-time knockout victory over Anthony Burchek. And then he comes back and gets uh, knocked out in a devastating way against Nate Maness. The underrated Nate Maness, uh, a talented dude. Um, Tony Gravely, if you're not familiar with him, he has that Taekwondo background, has the, the, the deep wrestling background as well. His dad had him in all types of, of combat sports from a young age. Um, so you guys know that is something that I do carry a lot of stock in when you have a fighter that's been training since they're very young, that carries significant weight. I mean, we're talking about a career martial artist in Tony Gravely. Uh, and then you go past that, the guy is in the prime of his career at 30 years old, and he's been grinding it out with American top team for quite some time. You, you mix all that up, and you're talking about a very dangerous fighter. Um, you know, Tony Gravely, we could talk a little bit, a little bit about what he's done. Uh, the Brett Johns fight was a grueling fight. That was his UFC debut after getting the victory on Dana White's Contender Series. And that fight, he kind of got broke down by Brett Johns in the later, later half of the fight and got submitted. Uh, bounced back with a very tough fight over Gerald, uh, Geraldo De, De Fritas, and then the Burchak knockout. Uh, so realistically, he really hasn't, he really hasn't had that big, big time victory. He, the fights we're talking about that he's winning here against lower level opponents, right? Anthony Burchak, Geraldo De Fritas, a fun guy, but not really on the level. Uh, Ray Rodriguez, he doesn't really have that big win. And even if he gets a win over over Simon Oliveira, that's really not it either. So um, Gravely still has a big road in front of him. If he really wants to establish himself in the UFC, he has that type of potential. Um, Simon Oliveira, 18-3, and three, has big-time experience uh, coming into the UFC. Has that victory over jo uh, Jose Alde uh, in his um, Dana White's Contender Series fight that was four months ago. That was a tough fight for him. Alde had some moments in that fight as well. Um, Oliveira came out tough. Uh, Oliveira throws heavy shots. He, he has that, that um, you know, he has a very similar style to like a Jose Aldo or a a um, a, a prime uh, name slip of my mind, man. I'm getting old over here. Uh, the former bantamweight champion, Jose Aldo's training partner. Um, oh, God, what's happening to me, boys? I used to spit these names off like nothing. Anyways, you guys know I'm talking about the guy whose career fell off a cliff. And uh, hit me up in the comment section. Um, come on, give me the name here. The heck? Anyways, you guys know what I'm talking about. That that very aggressive Brazilian Muay Thai type of striking. Oliveira comes out early in his fights and throws heavy leg kicks, uh, throws powerful shots. Um, definitely, he'll look to try to get you down to the mat too and use some of his jujitsu there. He's a well-rounded fighter. Um, did slow down a little bit in, in that all-day fight. So you know, you keep an eye on that as well. And uh, oh, look at me, man! I'm still trying to remember the guy's the, the dude's name. Come on, what's wrong with me over here, boys? Watch this! Boom! There he is, Henan Barrow. How do you guys like that? You didn't even have to wait too long. I even uh, paused the video while I pulled it up. You guys, sometimes you, some of you guys don't understand too, man. When you're up here on the mic, man, and you're just rambling and you're, you're talking and whatnot, your brain kind of doesn't work the same way as when you're just chilling on the couch listening to something. Because I do it all the time when I'm listening to Joe Rogan or something and I hear him, uh, you know, misspeak on, on a certain fighter, forget a fighter's name. I'm like, how the hell does he forget that? That's so easy because I know all this stuff. But you know what it is when you're in front of the mic? Uh, sometimes it's a little different because, of course, I mean, I know Henan Barrow uh, towards from the, the beginning of his career almost, you know, since obviously his UFC debut and all that, and the guy was a savage. Um, but again, I just wanted to reference his fighting style. Same in Oliveira. I seen some flashes of him that reminded me kind of, kind of, of, um, of a Henan Barrow or a Jose Aldo, heavy leg kicks. Uh, he's vicious with the striking, uh, but he could also grapple as well. I mean, he, this guy does show to have some promise. Uh, I think that 
People may be overlooking him in this spot here as we see Tony Gravely right around a minus 250. And we'll go take a look at the live line here. Um, I think that the line is a little off with, with Oliveira being right around a plus 210. Um, I'm a little surprised to see that. But, but I guess people are still um, ho holding Tony Gravely stock pretty high, which I don't really have a problem with because you guys know I like him. I do like him as a fighter. He, he's... A very complete and well-rounded fighter. I'm going to edge Gravely in the, the wrestling exchanges and those grappling exchanges. I think that Gravely should be able to avoid any type of submission as well. And I could see him being the fighter that, that ends up on top and uh, solidifies rounds like that. He could hold his own on the feet as well. Gravely has some, some solid boxing. I referenced the Taekwondo background he has as well. So, I mean, this is a guy that's well-versed on the feet. Um, and is actually going to have about a two-inch reach advantage over Simon, who's only an inch taller. So if, if some of you guys were breaking on tape on these two guys, before you actually uh, look at the the how they they match up from a size standpoint, you, some of you guys probably were were believing that Simon would be uh, a lot more of a rangy fighter, a lot more or a lot taller and more rangy. But that's not really the case, and uh, because Gravely ends up he, Gravely tends to be the shorter fighter in a lot of his fights i don't think that he cuts too much weight at least to my knowledge i don't think that he does uh fighting at the bantamweight division um you know five foot five but but he's okay here he is okay here um i like gravely as i said i think that uh, he has more tools in his arsenal to get things done here Samen will have to prove more to me uh, before I would, would, would ever pick him in a spot like this. And again, he had some flashes in the first round of that fight against Jose Alde, but slowed down in the later rounds. Uh, ended up doing enough to, to get the fight, though, uh, to get that victory there. So you got to give him credit as well. Uh, but Tony Gravely is just a more well-rounded fighter who, again, has been grinding it out at over, over at American Top Team. And I expect the skills to, to continue uh, to grow. And you guys know uh, I am very... I am high on fighters that come off losses a little bit more so than some people. A lot of people, when they see a fighter lose, they they, they kind of uh, drop the, their their stock in that fighter. I'm not really uh, so much that type of guy for the most part. You know, if I see a guy lose a fight like Tony Gravely just did, he got devastatingly knocked out. Be a little wary of the chin issues if he gets connected on again, but also know that he went back to the drawing board and he grinded grinded this fight camp probably more than he's ever had. I, I believe that. I think that he's as hungry for a victory here as he's probably ever been. Um, so I'm going to side with the very hungry Tony Gravely, who already has that octagon experience behind him, trains with the best of them at ATT. I go with Gravely to win this fight. Now, as far as the line goes, I'm not crazy about the line, though, uh, as I kind of stated already. I think that um, maybe there's more value on Oliveira, possibly, but I, I don't know how comfortable I feel grabbing gravely especially as high as minus 275 i'm not really crazy about it um but but tony gravely will be my pick matt frivola taking on gennaro valdez this fight right here you guys want to put a little asterisk next to this fight this has the the makings to be fight of the night in my opinion both these guys have a history of putting it all on the line and performing in very entertaining fights matt frivola Coming off two losses, but again, a guy that always lays it on the line. Um, you know, coming off a devastating knockout against Terrence McKinney and uh, getting whooped up by Armand Saruki. And before that, Armand, one of the top guys in the division. Um, Provola, though, this is a guy he can wrestle. Uh, he has decent power in his hands, decent boxing. He's a little bit lacking in his striking defense, in my opinion. He's, he gets a little, uh, a little reckless in there at times. I mean, we saw it in his UFC debut where he, he got laid out, and that was a very tough fight. He was undefeated at the time. People were very high in him. Uh, Marco Polo Reyes, you know, flatlined him. Uh, bounced back with, with some big victories, though, taking out Jalen Turner. That was a big-time win. Uh, the, the Luis Pena fight, I was there for that fight live. I kind of thought Pena probably eked it out. The crowd was going crazy for for, for, for Vola. Kind of helped him get the decision there. Um, and then again, though, two tough losses in a row. Now he takes on the UFC newcomer and uh, Gennaro Valdez. Gennaro Valdez, a training partner of Brandon Moreno's. I referenced earlier, he was involved in probably the most exciting Dana White's Contender Series fight that I've ever seen. Um, again, this is why I say that these these two guys right here have all the makings uh, of, or, or the, all the potential to go to war and have one of the, the best fights on this fight card. Um, Gennaro Valdez, if you guys didn't see that Dana White's Contender Series fight, I highly recommend that you guys go check it out. The first round was just crazy, balls-to-the-wall type action. Uh, Valdez showed that he had a gas tank. He was really pushing the pace, going for takedowns. He never gassed out, got caught with a lot of big shots. 
showed that he has a, a ridiculous chin. A8 shots left and right. I mean, he was uh, a little weary, weary in there. He was eating shots and he was still on his feet, still throwing back. Um, and then you got to love the fact that he comes out in the second round and then he looks to get the finish and he does. He gets the finish early in that second round. So you want to talk about heart. Um, I mean, Gennaro Valdez is cut from a different cloth, in my opinion. Definitely needs to so needs to show some more in regards to uh, his skill set. I mean, we're, we're not really, in my opinion, I'm not completely sold on him uh, from, from a skill set standpoint. A lot more needs to be shown there. Um you know, has good boxing, has some, some good hands, needs to sharpen some things up, though. I want to see some more from him on the ground. We know that Frivola is a guy that, that you know, he has that wrestling background, so Frivola can try to lean on, on his wrestling to maybe get some takedowns and, and try to solidify some rounds. Um, that, that's definitely going to be an X factor in this fight. I'm, I'm curious to see if Frivola is able to implement the wrestling game there. And... Um, you know, I, I did have Matt Frivola on MMA Live Discussion, a great dude. His mom even uh, featured on the show. It was kind of funny. She popped in there in the patio. Frivola is a, a class act dude. I'm a big fan of his. And um, he has a big fight lined up in front of him here. Uh, can he take out the, the undefeated newcomer? Uh, Frivola has that octagon experience and all that. We take a look at them from a, a size standpoint. Uh, pretty much identical. Nothing really going on there. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to side with Gennaro Valdez here. Uh, I know he, he's an underdog in this fight, but I think that Gennaro, he, he shows to have, uh, some, some certain skills that really might help him prevail here. Uh, the, the, the boxing, um, skills that he brings to the table. He has some decent hands. I could see him landing some shots on Frivola. Frivola's coming off that devastating knockout, uh, where, where his chin was really, uh, put to the test there. And it might be, uh, a, a little hurt right now. But he, let's see how long it's been since that fight. It's been about six months. So typically when you see a guy get flatlined like that, you would like that for them to take almost a year off, you know, uh, you know, and not even just getting knocked out. But if you take an extreme amount of punishment, you'd like to see them take almost a year off. And uh, for Vola's coming back uh, with only six months of a break, if Gennaro Valdez can land some big shots, I would not be shocked if he can shut for Vola's lights out. I think that Gennaro can turn this fight into a war and he could slightly get the better of Frivola. Who, uh, Frivola, you know, he, he'll be willing to mix things up, but I think that Gennaro will be the guy that kind of lands a little bit more on the feet with it, with his striking. Uh, but again, Frivola has the X factor with the wrestling, so that's what you want to keep an eye on there. Frivola has very solid wrestling. He has solid jiu-jitsu, and um, I, I do edge him there. But overall, uh, I'm going to take a dog, take the dog here in Gennaro, uh, who I know who was putting in some big time work with Brandon Moreno as Moreno trains for the big trilogy fight. Uh, so that's always a big thing too. And uh, we take a look at the live line. And uh, right now we got Gennaro Valdez right around a plus 175. Uh, he, he's dropping a little bit down towards that plus 150 range on certain books. Um, and, and I will side with him to win the fight and uh, expect things to get dirty in there. And uh, Valdez has shown that that he can be involved in, in a crazy war and prevail there. Frivola has shown that at times as well, but a little bit more impressed from, from that, that last fight that Valdez just had. I'll take him to win the fight there. Michael Morales taking on Trevin Giles. This guy, Michael Morales, if you guys are not familiar with him, had a big-time victory on Dana White's Contender Series three months ago against Nikolai Verentikinov. Let's go with that. Let's try that one more time. You guys ready? See if we can get that. Nikolay Verent Verentanikov. And uh, Verentanikov is a guy that that was a pretty well versed veteran. He was a big favor going in that fight against a guy, Michael Morales, who only had experience fighting over in the regional scene of Ecuador. Um coming he came into that fight at eleven and 0. Uh, I'll I'll be the first to admit that I was very surprised at the performance that Michael Morales put on. He was able to out wrestle. The very tough Russian. Uh, you would not typically expect that from an Ecuadorian fighter. You don't really hear uh, much about their wrestling and whatnot. But uh, come to find out that Morales is, uh, I don't know how much weight you would put into this, but one of the better wrestlers fighting out of Ecuador. And he was involved in their wrestling scene and whatnot. Uh, so that is a good thing. Uh, he has a, a, a big time frame for the division. He's a true athlete. These are some of the things that he has going for himself. And he really impressed in that fight. Um, now, I will say this much. If you guys remember, Dana White in the post-fight press press conference 
after that episode, I think Dana White may have been drinking before that episode or maybe some of the medicine he was taking for his uh, his Meniere's disease or something was kicking in. But if you guys remember, he was comparing the potential of of Michael uh, Morales to to having some type of potential of like a future Michael Jordan of MMA because he's so young and the reason why he's going to sign him is because he has a potential to be a goat to be a goat and stuff like this and I remember listening to that and I was like oh something's off with Dana today for him to see that performance and to just say those type of statements to me was a little ridiculous I think he was just a little bit excited or whatnot or maybe Maybe he had some money on the fight. Maybe he like had a relative put some money on the fight. You know, Dana likes to bet. Never talks about betting on MMA, but you know he bets on all types of sports. Supposedly, you hear little things. You don't think he ever bets on the fights? Maybe he had an inside scoop about this kid being good, and and he was a dog, and he capitalized there and got excited and started saying ridiculous statements like that. I don't know. Anyways, though, uh, I think most of you guys would agree. Taking the leap to compare him to being a future goat is by far. Uh, a stretch there. He's 12-0. and Let's see how he performs against a guy in Trevin Giles. In my opinion, I think Nicolay was just off on that night. Uh, looked to be a little slow in there. Uh, Michael Morales had the speed advantage. He was quicker uh, with, with all his tactics, you know, making the, the, the move, um, whether he was striking or, go, you know, transitioning to a, a takedown attempt. He was just a, a step ahead of Nicolay there. Uh, Trevin Giles, though, he, he's a solid test. Uh, Trevin Giles, 14-3. and He has... A decent amount of UFC experience. He could strike. He can grapple. Um, he, he can do a little bit of it all. And uh, he's a guy that's battle tested. I mean, you know, he had that very close fight with James Kraus. Uh, although Kraus took that fight on short notice and bumped up in weight, still a, uh, a, a an impressive performance there. Uh, the knockout over Bavon Lewis, the victory over Roman Dolge, uh, or Dolize, should I say? I, I did finally figure out how to pronounce his name, and I pronounced his name right in that video where I, I really dug into him. For that whole situation with, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, the South uh, African, what's his name there? Look at me, man. Woo. I'm losing my memory over here. Anyways, I did the whole video with uh, Cheyenne uh, Vlismus uh, and JP Bays. And um, you guys probably know what I'm talking about in regards to that. But anyway, uh, and, you know, and Trevin Giles' last fight, though, he gets uh, knocked out by Drickus Duplessis. That guy Drickus has nasty knockout power. He's been knocking guys out left and right. I think that it was just a tough fight for Trevin. Uh, I still do believe that Trevin is a, a solid fighter. And um, I think he's a major step for Michael, Michael Morales as Morales makes his UFC debut at the age of 22 years old. Where you got a guy in Trevin who's 29, entering the prime of his career. He's very hungry coming off that loss. And, um, you know, he has that experience here. Um, I am going to side with Trevin Giles to win this fight. Um, again, I know that he had a tough, tough loss in his last fight. Uh, Michael Morales didn't really show to me too much to be, uh, a major threat with the striking in regards to testing that chin again, like Drickus Duplessis did. I think it's a little bit of a different type of fighter. I think Morales will look to uh, throw some combinations, maybe try to mix in some wrestling attempts. Uh, he's a well-rounded fighter. Uh, Trevin Giles has, has been there before and, um, I think that we're really going to get an understanding of where Michael Morales is after this fight. Uh, I'm just not ready to to buy into all the hype. And for him coming into this fight as a favorite in his UFC debut after that one victory over Nikolay uh, Ver And uh, and real quick, we'll, we'll pull up we'll pull up Nikolay. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with him or if you didn't see that fight, he's nine and four, uh, the Kazaki fighter. Uh, fighting out of, fighting out of Kings MMA, he had Benil Dariush in his corner and all that. People were very high on him. Like I said, he was a big favorite. He was in the you know 32 years old. He's in the prime of his um, you know of, of his body and all that going into that fight, and he disappointed in a major way. But if you take a look at his record, who who was he really? Um, I mean, you take a look. I mean, look at these losses here, and then who who has he really beat? Uh, Artinius Young, 10 and 11. Uh, I mean, a lot, it's a pretty much a padded record. His biggest win was probably over Charlie Ontiverios, who's a guy that's just known for jumping in uh, on a late late notice fight against Kevin Holland and getting finished. Uh, other than that, I mean, Anthony Ivey, okay, he had the victory over him. So I think that people are putting in a little bit too much stock into that fight that Michael Morales had there. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about Dana White as well. And uh, I think Trevin Giles is a guy that's proven. I'm going to side with Trevin here. And uh, we take a look at the live line. Trevin Giles, the the dog here, 
opened up right around that plus 130 range action coming in on him a little bit going down to plus 115 you may see this fight even out a little bit more so over over the fight week uh, with people possibly seeing some value in Giles here with the experience and whatnot. Trevin Giles is my pick to win the fight. Rodolfo Vieira taking on Wellington Terman. Uh, Wellington the third comes from a, a very, very uh, wealthy uh, lineage. Um, I'm just playing with you guys. I made that up. But anytime you see a guy with the first name Wellington, uh, you got to assume that he was the third or fourth um you know son or grandson you know named after the the great great grandfather and that they come from a very very wealthy lineage uh just because the name's wellington uh but i don't really think that's the case here who knows though maybe he uh, that is the case um but you know back to this fight man rodolfo vieira taking on wellington Terman. uh this guy rodolfo vieira we all we always start with talking about his jiu-jitsu credentials obviously he's a black belt but he's a, a whole different type of black belt uh he's one of the the nastiest Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners on planet Earth. This guy, um, they call him the black belt hunter. Cut from a different cloth as far as the jiu-jitsu game goes. Um, but you know what? He does have some holes in his game, for sure. Uh, you know, he had that that submission victory over Safarov in his... Uh, excuse me, that was actually his second fight. Submitted Oscar P Pichota, Pichota first, then got the submission over uh, Safarov. But then he did show that, that he had some holes in his game against Anthony Hernandez. And uh, that was a fight where he gassed out and was actually submitted by a guy, Anthony Fluffy Hernandez, who the thought of him submitting Rodolfo Vieira, uh, it's almost comical going into that fight. But when a guy is completely gassed out, it's a whole different type of fight. And that's what happened. So Vieira is a guy that you really always got to question in regards to his cardio, carries a lot of muscle mass, you know, he has those quick twitch type of muscles. This is a guy that likes to be explosive and and really try to get you out of there quick. And if he doesn't, could could come in, into some problems. Um, but you know what? In his last fight, uh, he bounced back in a major way over Dustin Stolzfus because it wasn't just the victory, but it was the way he got the victory. The fight went a little bit later. Uh, in the fight went towards the... I think, I think it reached the second, possibly. I'm not sure if it reached the third. But either way, he was still looking good in those later rounds and actually had a, a, uh, a, second, a second win in that fight. And he ended up getting that submission victory over the tough uh, Dustin Stolzfus, uh, who's also more of a grappling-based fighter. So that was a big, big win for him. Now, um, am I completely sold on him? I mean, he comes into all these fights as a giant favorite. I think that there's... There's something to be worried with when you're backing him at times because if his cardio gives out, you're going to be in trouble again. Um, and real quick, too, I don't know who this guy is that's next to him. If you guys know who this guy is, um, this guy looks like a mountain of a man. Uh, Vieira is is uh, not that small of a guy himself, and uh, whoever this dude is is towering over him. I guess his name is the classic Viking. I'd like to see this guy fight in the UFC's heavyweight division. Um, I'm sure he could grapple, too, if he's, he's rolling around with Vieira. But... Um, but yeah, man, Vieira is a guy you got to be cautious with in regards to the cardio. Uh, Wellington Terman, more of a well-rounded fighter, more of a striker, uh, has some jujitsu. Obviously, if this was a straight jujitsu matchup or or if this fight hits the mat early, uh, Terman's definitely going to be in trouble, and there's definitely potential for him to get uh, subbed quickly. And, and that's just going to be the issue with anyone that gets matched up with Vieira here. Uh, Wellington Terman needs to weather the storm, drag this fight into the later rounds where he can start to pick apart Vieira. Uh, I expect Terman to have a, a significant edge in regards to the striking. Uh, so so he does have that edge there as well. Vieira is very uh, muscular and stiff. He's working on his boxing, though. He's working on his jab very much, too. If you, if you saw his last fight, he's definitely getting sharper with the jab. He was landing that uh, at, at will. But I think that might have been a little bit more so the fact that Stolzfus is really not too good on the feet. And I think Stolzfus was very worried about the takedown there. And it kind of affected that. Terman with uh you know what 22 professional fights compared to Vieira's nine professional fights but Vieira with a, a world of of experience in the combat world with all the jiu-jitsu tournaments that he's participated in um uh, we're gonna take a look at the live line right now uh this is a fight that I've been back and forth on as you guys can probably tell here uh Vieira right around a minus uh 265 uh excuse me an opening on, at a minus 265 on DraftKings now at a minus 225 so action coming in on Terman so people are probably paying attention to those those cardio issues and the red flags that we've seen from Vieira um let, let's take a little bit more of a look into Wellington, what Wellington Terman has done recently 
Uh, we know that he got that big victory over Sam Alvey. He needed that victory big time. Otherwise, that would have been three losses in a row. And he may have been getting his walking papers, but uh, lives to see another day in the octagon. Got finished by Bruno Silva. Lost to Andrew Sanchez as well. Both those fights uh, got finished by strikes. Um, trying to pull up a, a loss uh, via submission. Really can't pull one up here. So uh, not to say that he's going to be able to to out grapple or hang there but you know if he can avoid that early submission he could he could drag this fight into the deep waters and um whew. you know I, i'm gonna pick wellington Terman here how about that i wasn't gonna do it i've been back and forth on this fight i was gonna go with Vieira. Uh, but Vieira is very stiff on the feet. I don't think that that jab is going to be enough. I think he's going to be diving for those takedowns and try to get the job done early there. But if he doesn't get it done, I think Terman can, can win this fight. And um, yeah, if you take a look at the line, obviously I, I find more value in, in, in Wellington Terman. Um, and again, I know you guys have been roasting me with, with pick and favorite. So you guys are pressuring me to go in on some of these dogs. I mean, you guys are ruthless in the comment section on my IG and my comment section here and then the YouTube channel uh, weekly. So I gotta throw some dogs at you guys. Otherwise, I'm gonna be hearing about it um, all week. But all jokes aside, I, I really think there's an avenue of victory for Wellington Terman here. So uh, I will pick him to win the fight. And I also want to throw this in real quick. A couple of you guys have been in the comment section asking for over unders and whatnot. If there was a fight that you want to target uh, for an under, this is probably an, uh, a fight that you would want to target. Uh, Rodolfo Vieira obviously can get that submission nice and early in the fight. And Wellington Terman, if he's able to avoid that submission, I think he could really start to put it on Vieira. And, uh, you know, Vieira has struggles with the gas tank. He could start to, to land some big shots there. He could even get a submission on Vieira. We saw that in the Anthony Hernandez fight. Or even get a TKO or a knockout. Uh, so in regards to looking for an under, I know uh, there was someone specifically that's been asking me to put put something out like that to you guys. So there's my under. That, that's my under for the fight card. If you want me to give out a, an under, I would go with this. Now, I'm not sure exactly what line you're going to get on that. Let's go pull that up. We'll we'll discuss that in the comment section, especially who, whoever you were that has been continuously asking me to put that out there. Well, what line can you get on the under on this fight? Let's discuss that in the comment section. And from what I'm seeing right here, we got the, the under one and a half rounds, right around a plus 110 to a minus 111, depending on the book. Uh, with only specific books having that line out available to you guys already, and if we're looking at the under two and a half rounds, we're talking at a talking about a minus two hundred. So they they obviously they the majority feels that's the the most likely outcome here, but uh, not a ridiculous line really. Um, so that that will be uh, an under I'll give to you guys if you want that. All right, we're on the main card now. Michelle Pajera taking on Andre Fialo. And uh, this is going to be a fun fight. You guys already know anytime Michelle Pajeda is stepping in there, is that we're going to see some acrobatic and wild stuff. This guy has quickly become one of the most uh, entertaining fighters to, to fight in the UFC. This guy has become a real fan favorite, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned. I like watching this guy fight. Uh, three victories in a row, but let's also understand that he absolutely beat down Diego Sanchez and he got DQ'd, so that should be four fights in a row. And then he had that one tough fight against Tristan Connolly where his gas tank actually lacked a little bit and uh, he, he was actually um, kind of broken down in that fight. But since that fight, really hasn't showed or shown to to make that, that, that same kind of <clears throat> um, mistakes, that same type of uh, error in his fight. I mean, he's been bouncing back, looking good in there. His cardio has been holding up. And uh, like I said, three fights in a row now, taking out guys like uh, Zilam Amadayev. Wouldn't hold too much stock in that, though. Uh, but the KS Williams fight was a big one. The Nico Price uh, victory was a big one. Those are two solid fighters. Now, Andre uh, Fialo, if you're not familiar with him, uh, this is a guy that's that has a significant experience on some big in some big promotions. We've seen him fighting over in Bellator for years. We've seen him over on the PFL scene. Um, and this is a guy that's been very busy as of recently. Uh, Deerfield Beach. It's where I was born. Uh, I wouldn't say fully raised, but born. I was born in Deerfield Beach, man. A lot of uh, Brazilian fighters out of there these days. He's Portuguese, but um, of course, uh, they, they both speak Portuguese there. So uh, Andre Fialo, let's just talk about what he's done recently over the past year. He gets that big victory uh, and towards the beginning of 2021 over James Vick. Uh, you can pull that entire fight up on YouTube. And uh, it's always fun to watch James Vick uh, get knocked out in that type of way, especially after he said Justin Gaethje was going to become the Homer Simpson of MMA. 
and uh, how ironically James Vick became the absolute definition uh, of a Homer Simpson. The guy just constantly getting teed off on. That was a nasty knockout. He got finished uh, on the feet. Uh, he was basically out on his feet there, and uh, that was a nasty knockout. So, you know, Fialo showing to be a precision striker in that fight. But then, look, goes uh, goes into action three more times to to end the year uh, and getting knockouts in all of them. The the uh, Stefan uh, Sekulish fight, uh, Stefan, a guy that fought in the octagon once before, that was a nasty one. Uh, he was uh, Stefan was leaning on Andre there, and, and Andre hit just... Touched him with an elbow that dropped him, and then he followed up and finished him off. So this guy can, can finish you, man. This guy, he knows how to get the job done uh, in regards to get, getting the knockout. Uh, he's a precision striker. Again, I referenced some of the, the experience he had over on the Bellator scene. You know, if you guys remember watching him fight over there, had uh, five fights over in Bellator, uh, two fights over in PFL. Battled Chris Curtis. They get finished there in the third round, but Chris Curtis, you guys know, is a dangerous fighter. So, you know, he has a good amount of experience. Michelle Pajeda, you guys, we, we talked about him already a little bit. Um, this is gonna be this is gonna be a very interesting fight. Um, I, I think that uh this guy Andre ha has has more to prove. I mean, we, again, we talked about the four knockout victories he had in a row. Want to see what he can do against a little bit of, of higher level competition now, but his confidence has to be at an all time high. And um, you see him over here with Manil Cape. And um, I, I would love to see him go in here in, in his UFC debut and get a knockout, but I think that he's, he's going to have a, a, a tough time here, or uh, at least he has, he has a tough challenge in front of him, right? Michelle Pajera, this guy has crazy footwork. He's super diverse in the feet. And I think if Andre Fialo doesn't get that knockout, uh, if he's not able to close the distance and, and get in on him and land that shot, I have a tough time seeing him winning a decision. I think Michelle Pajera is, is more diverse with his kicks. Uh, he's funky in there. The judges like his fighting style. The fans like his fighting style. Uh, it, it does translate to decision victories as well. Uh, not just finishes, but when you're watching him make his opponent look kind of goofy in there with, with the way you're, he's dancing around them and, and hitting them with spinning attacks and all types of funky Superman punches and whatnot. Um, it, it, it it looks good for the judges' scorecards. And uh, I do favor Pajeda to win that decision. Um, as far as, as uh, Pajeda from... Getting a finish for, on his end, uh, I mean, as of recently, I mean, he had the rear naked choke against Amadayev, uh, the flying knee knockout that he followed up with a punch against Danny Roberts. You know, he, he has some knockouts in his resume, too. So there's some potential for that, not necessarily expecting that, um, but but there is some potential for that. I kind of favor him winning a decision. I think his footwork will, will, will be uh, great, as always. I think he'll be able to... Um, Keep that movement going. Score points. I think I favor Pajeda winning a decision. But just keep in mind, guys, this is what I want to say. If you guys aren't familiar with with what um, Andre uh, Fialo brings to the table, we're talking about a very legit fighter, a very competent fighter, a well-rounded fighter, and a guy that shouldn't be overlooked here. And uh, especially for a guy that's that's coming into this fight at that, that plus 250 range, uh, I would say there's more value on Andre Fialo in this fight. I am going to pick Pajeda. Um, Michelle Pajera to win the fight, but understand guys, I want you guys to understand something here. Just because I pick a fighter, I also want to go into detail where the where there's more value in the line. So don't always get caught up in my, just my picks and saying, oh, this guy just picks favorites. Uh, I'll pick my dogs and whatnot too, but understand that I think that this fight is more likely, uh, we're more likely to see Michelle Pajera win this fight via decision and that's the way I'm going to go. I'm going to I'm going to pick the most likely outcome and what I see. I like Michelle Pajeda as a fighter, but in regards to the betting line, I see more value on Andre Fialo and I'm letting you guys know that this guy is a a legit fighter if you didn't know that already. Okay? So try to understand what I'm what I'm trying to bring to the table to you guys. I'm not here just picking favorites. Um maybe when I say that that's me trying to give you guys a heads up from my point of view. If you could read between the lines, I wouldn't favor betting on Michelle Pajeda at that line. Maybe you want to pick him to win via decision so you get a little bit better of a line or you want to avoid the fight or maybe you want to take Andre Fialo as a dog. That's kind of where I'm coming from here. Uh, I might not even touch it at all, but that's where I'm coming from. If you guys could read between the lines and, and uh, what I'm trying to give to you guys here on, on the show. Um, my pick to win the fight is Michelle Pajera. Saeed Nurmagomedov taking on Cody Stamen. It's a solid fight here in the bantamweight division. Cody Stamen coming off two losses, but do understand this is a, a very talented fighter. Good boxing, good wrestling. Uh, a little bit uh, on the more stocky and shorter side for the division. Does have issues with fighters that 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 have that 
that length and reach. And, and he's going to be facing that issue here in this fight. Syed Nur Nurmagomedov going to be two inches taller, but he's also going to have five and a half inches of reach uh, in regards to his arms. But understand as well, he's, he's uh, a more... Or he is a taller fighter too, so he's going to have some of that length in his legs as well. And Saeed Nurmagomedov is a guy that really favors his kicks. He loves to throw kicks out there. Uh, he's much more of a diverse striker than Cody. Cody will throw his basic leg kicks, but really favors his hands. Uh, he's a technical boxer. He has some good power there. Saeed Nurmagomedov definitely has shown that he has skills in his hands as well. We saw him with that nasty knockout over Mark Stregel in his last fight. Caught him with that, that step-in left hook. Uh, Astrego was coming in and, and got the finish there. Uh, Nurmagomedov, 14 and 2. I had that loss over Hione Hi Barcelos. Uh, Bar Barcelos, a guy fighting on this card as well. You guys know I'm extremely high on him. And again, uh, if you didn't realize too, I I'm going to have the um, the timestamp for that fight and the video of where that fight was initially broke down in. So don't don't think that I skipped that fight. Uh, it is available for you guys. Uh, and Hione Barcelos is the real deal. And uh, he was able to go to, to a decision with him two years ago. Uh, Syed, now 29 years old, creeping into the prime of his career. I think that he is a very dangerous fighter, and uh, I am high on him. I like his frame. Uh, I want to talk about the different frames of these guys real quick. Uh, I've... I've always been more of a guy that favors this type of frame than the stocky fighter. Curious what your guys' opinions are, are on that too. I remember a long time ago, I had a buddy of mine that, uh, you know, he used to try to argue with me. This is way, way back in the day when I was even getting involved in training MMA uh, in my teens and whatnot. And he used to say he was a short, stocky dude. And he's like, I got the best, um, the best body type. He's like, I should start getting into MMA too, this and that. And uh, th this is the type of body style you want to have. He's like, I always see guys thriving with the, the short, stocky, strong uh, wrestling style. I disagree. I've always felt that if you're a little bit more rangy, a little bit more of that athletic build, and then, of course, you work on your wrestling and whatnot, I think you're way more dangerous of a, t uh, of a fighter. The John Jones type of style, the Anderson Silva type of, of physique, uh, the Syed Nurmagomedov for the division, a more rangy guy, because you could still pick up that wrestling. You could stuff those those takedowns from those short, stocky guys, and then you could pick them apart with the striking. You, you have... Uh, a little bit more to work with in regards to the striking with your kicks and whatnot. I'm curious what you guys think. Um, but I like, I, I do favor the more rangy opponents. But of course, now when we're breaking down fights, you can't just say, oh, because the guy's more rangy or stocky. That's a very basic and elementary mindset. Uh, but I'm just talking about when you have comparable comparable fighters, I like the rangy fighters. I, I do. And I th the reason why I talk about that here is because I think that Sayed, Sayed Nur Nurmagomedov has... Uh, a major avenue of victory by using his kicks from the outside and, and uh, giving Cody a tough time coming in and, and, and closing the distance there. Now, Cody does have good footwork, like I said, good boxing, good wrestling. So, I mean, this is a guy that will try to test Saeed, but I, I favor Nurma Gimadoff to win this fight here. Um, and this will be a, a tough fight for, for Stamen now, you know, just recently losing to Marab. Uh, do I, do I, do I, excuse me here. Do I, I call him Dual Vashili, Dual Vashili, however you want to say that. Uh, Jimmy Rivera, and um, Jimmy Rivera, a tough customer too, but that's a fight statement should have had, really. Uh, Jimmy Rivera has shown recently he's been a little bit caught up with some things outside the octagon, it seems, and, and he's lost some fights that uh, he probably should have won. I think Cody could have capitalized there. Uh, you got to go back to his Brian Kelleher victory to talk about his last victory. Uh, he had a... a a majority decision draw against Yadong Song. Song was very young at the time. Cody, a lot, a lot more of a mature fighter at the time. If they fought again, I definitely favor Song to pull that fight off. Um, so yeah, man, my, my pick is going to be Syed Nurmagomedov. We'll take a look at the live line here. He's just about a two to one favorite here, um, depending on what book you're looking at. Some some books he opened up at minus two twenty five. That's creeping to that minus two hundred range. So a little bit of of uh, action coming in on Cody Stamen. People seeing a little bit of, of potential value there. And again, Cody Stamen has solid boxing, solid wrestling, and uh, he's a good fighter. But I think I'm expecting a little bit more from Nurmagomedov here, and uh, especially moving forward. I expect him to, to be a guy that could be um, a solid name in the division, and that will be my pick. We have one of the biggest trilogies in the sport set to take place this upcoming Saturday. Brandon Moreno taking on Davison Figueroa. They're one and one, which even makes it that much more exciting. Uh, we take a look at some of the bigger trilogies that we've seen in the sport. Uh, of course, Tito Ortiz versus Ken Shamrock. Uh, that fight actually happened three times with Tito Ortiz 
basically doing what he wanted in those fights, smashing uh, old Ken Shamrock on the juice. Uh, but they were exciting at the time. Uh, other notable uh, trilogies, Randy Couture and Vitor Belfort with Randy winning two of the three. Uh, what else we got here? Frankie Edgar and BJ Penn. Uh, another interesting trilogy where Frankie was able to do his thing in all three of those fights. Charles Oliveira and Nick Lentz. Uh, believe it or not, that was a trilogy with that one no contest. And then uh, Oliveira uh, winning the, the other two fights. Uh, Tim Sylvia and Andre Arlovsky, two OGs in the game. And believe it or not, I had an interview with Tim Tim Sylvia. Uh, you guys can pull that up. Uh, it's, it's in the archives here on my channel. And uh, a very... Uh, a very cool dude. And uh, what else we got here? Uh, Forrest Griffin and Tito Ortiz with, uh, with Forrest winning two of the three as well. Uh, Cain Velasquez and JDS, of course, one of the other big time trilogies with Cain Velasquez uh, winning the, the, the latter two of the three. And with JDS getting that, that quick knockout uh, in the first fight. If you guys remember, that was the first fight, I believe, that ever took place. Uh, on Fox, if you guys remember, it was that big Fox card, and uh, that was a big time fight. It was on, uh, you know, basic television for the whole world to see. And JDS shut Kane's lights out, but then Kane, uh, after that, really got his revenge. Uh, Sam Stout and Spencer Fisher; those were some inter entertaining fights. With Sam Stout getting two of the three, uh, BJ Penn and Matt Hughes. Um, yeah, BJ Penn actually won two of those. If you remember, he actually knocked Matt Hughes out in that last fight as well. With Matt Hughes uh, creeping up in age. Miocic and Cormier. How could we forget that? Uh, with Stipe uh, winning two of the three. And uh, Cormier had that uh, that that one fight where he was able to get that that knockout in the clinch. Um, and uh, what else we got here? Yeah, Mi Miocic got that knockout. And then he also had the decision in the trilogy fight. GSP and Matt Hughes, of course. Uh, GSP at the time, very young, gets caught in that Kimura, right? And then after that, gets the... the, uh, the, the Two victories, getting the knockout. Got that head kick on Matt Hughes in the one fight. Also, uh, got a submission. Uh, Chuck Liddell and Randy Couture. I, I can go through these fights all days, man. I don't know about you guys. I'm a big fight fan. I, I love the history of the sport. And uh, Chuck Liddell got two of the three against Randy Couture. And uh, how many more we got of these? Frankie Edgar versus Gray Maynard. Quite possibly my favorite trilogy. If you guys have not seen these fights... You guys have to run the tape back in these fights. You talk about action. I mean, this is where Frankie Edgar made his name, taking damage early in all of these fights, but always coming back strong. And uh, yeah, those are those are some of the trilogies we've seen throughout the years. And Brandon Moreno and Davis, Davis and Figueroa, I believe that this fight is up there with all those fights I just listed off. This has all the makings to be an extraordinary fight, a very entertaining fight. The first one was nuts. The second one was nuts as, as long as it lasted. Now, Brandon Moreno uh, was much more the superior fighter the second time around. There has been some rumors that Figueredo was distracted and caught up with some other things outside uh, of fighting, trying to start a business and whatnot. Uh, I don't know how, how true those things are. Um, I mean, I do know that he looked to be in good shape in both fights. If you really take a look at him, I mean, he looked to be in phenomenal shape. I kind of... Uh, I kind of question those comments. It might be himself trying to to hype himself up and, and gain some confidence going into this third fight after he really was uh, styled on and, and really beat up in that third fight. Brandon Moreno was a step ahead. Uh, Figueroa did some things that were impressive in that fight. You know, he had one really nice uh, sweep and, and, and reversal where he was able to get back up to his feet off the mat. I mean, he is, of course, a very skilled fighter, uh, but he looked slow on the feet in that second fight. Brandon Moreno was... A complete step ahead of him in that fight. He was way quicker. Uh, even And of course, even in the grappling exchanges as he eventually got that submission. I've been very, very impressed with what I've seen from Moreno. Now also note that in that first fight, Moreno started to pick things up as that fight went on as well. Uh, you know, it was he was a little too late with it. But still, he was the one that was getting things going as that fight started to take place. So uh, obviously he took... The momentum from the end of that sec that first fight brought it into the second fight, and uh, I have a feeling that he'll be bringing it in, bringing it into this third fight as well. He's 28 years old, while Figueroa's 34, so Moreno creeping more into the prime of his career. Where Figueroa, uh, you know, going through these wars as of recently, creeping up in age. 34 for the the flyweight division is it's a little bit 
more up there, right? I mean, this is a division that really thrives on speed, and uh, Figueredo needs to work on the, on that speed. Um, like I said, looking a little slower in that last fight. Now he does carry big time power. He's a very physically strong fighter. Um, you've, I'm, I'm a big fan of Figueredo's, and if there's a fighter that can come off a tough loss, come back very motivated and do some some serious things in in the rematch or the trilogy here, uh, Figueredo is that guy. So I would not completely uh, turn my back on him at all. Um, that being said, though, I, I just think that a lot of things favor Moreno in this trilogy. Um, as I noted, the age, um, the, the skill set, skill set uh, peaking. I think Moreno's skill set is peaking more so. I think he's becoming more of a complete fighter uh, as Figueredo already with 23 professional fights at the age that he's at. I think that, um, I mean, I'm sure he's working on some things, but I think that he's more set as a fighter uh, for who he is. And... Um, you know, you, you want to keep an eye on his power as well. If maybe he maybe he can hurt Moreno. Um, I mean, he has that type of power where he could really hurt anybody in the division at any given time. You see him over here with some of the greats, John Jones and Henry Cejudo, putting in that work. And this was uh, in December, uh, so just recently. So, I mean, you, you love to see him brushing shoulders with guys like that. And uh, supposedly he's extremely motivated for this fight and he thinks he's ready to go. Um, now... Uh, it, it, again, if you want to take a look into that first fight, they, they really went at it. You, you, you have a lot of tape to to dissect there, 25 minutes of action. Um, now, the the second time they fight, as I said, Moreno was just a step ahead, man, throwing beautiful leg kicks, uh, just, just much quicker in there. And I really feel that Moreno is going to be the quicker guy again. I don't expect too much to change in there. I think Figueredo is going to have to have made some major changes for this fight, not only from a training standpoint, but from a, a, a mental standpoint. Because when the second fight kicked off, it seemed almost as if Brandon Moreno was much more willing to go to war and was much more willing to to take a beating and take da more damage. He was willing to to put in that work to get the victory. Whereas Figueredo, it's almost like he didn't want to do, do uh, a repeat of that first fight. He was more on the back foot. It looked like he was trying to avoid that action a little bit more so to an extent, and, um, you know, you, you got to wonder why. Uh, I mean, Figueroa, like I said, he's been through some wars. He's, he's been around for a long time. Moreno, just maybe the, the younger lion, uh, you know, taking the the pride or whatnot from from the the older older uh, alpha lion. It almost has that type of vibe here, and uh, which is why I am going to pick Brandon Moreno. If you guys dissect that last fight, and you even dissect the first fight towards the end of it, uh, Moreno is the guy that, that has... The, the stock going up and Figueredo has the stock going down uh, as much as I would love to, to back Figueredo here because I'm a big fan of his. And when you see dog odds next to his name, I mean, you, you, you kind of got to scratch your head. But uh, Moreno is is who I, I like in this fight. I like Moreno. I love the fact that he I believe he was the first. Yes, he was the first U, uh, Mexican champion in the UFC. I love that aspect, too. I'm a big fan of his. I love his personality. This is a guy that doesn't uh, let, let the stardom get to his head. This is a guy that's very grounded. He's just a regular dude. And um, yeah, I'm a big fan of his. And um, you know, we talked about his training partner, Gennaro uh, Valdez. You see him over here getting in that work. And uh, who's this over here? Uh, looks familiar too, but I, I'm not going to click on his name right now. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, I mean, these guys are, are the real deal. Expect crazy cardio from Moreno, crazy heart, uh, expect, I mean, he even has the Lego champion belt as well. They built him a little Lego champion belt. Big fan of his. I got to go with Moreno in the trilogy fight. I think he wins two of the, of the three fights there and, uh, expect Moreno to, to be doing his thing in the division. But there are some guys working their way through the ranks that are, are going to, pose a threat to him but as of right now Moreno will be defending his belt in my opinion now we take a look at the, the live betting line with Moreno uh right around a minus 180 minus 170 to a minus 180 range you're getting that that value on Figueroa if you like him you can get him right around plus 155 plus 150 um which if you're willing to take that stab on Figueroa I don't necessarily have a problem with it uh if he comes into this fight like he's he seems to be extremely motivated and he changes a couple things he's a stud and uh, former champion, this could end up being a more competitive fight than the second time. Could be a little bit more like the first fight. I still got to say that Moreno's the guy that digs a little deeper and is a little bit fresher. And uh, I side with Moreno to win the fight. Who do you guys have in this fight? I really want to know. Comment below. We got to talk about something here. Uh, had a couple of you little bad seeds in the comment section. I guess some of you guys had a bad experience with Bovada. But really... 
didn't have any uh, validity to what you were saying here. But uh, again, I do believe Bovada is the best sports book I've seen online. This is my personal opinion. I want to make something clear. I do not work for Bovada. Uh, yes, I do get a, a bonus for referring people, but I could choose any website I want to work with. They all give different types of referrals. I truly believe that Bovada is the best website out there. If any of you guys have any valid points, uh, comment below rather than just saying Bovada is not good or whatever, because I'm telling you guys from my uh, my wealthy experience betting online, Bovada has been the best to me compared to any other website. I talked about betonline.ag, uh, how they, they BS with the bonuses that they give you. They're fake bonuses. If they give you a $100 bonus, when you use that $100 to wager, you get the winnings if you win, but you lose the actual $100 that you placed. So if you won 80 bucks, you only get 80 bucks back in your account where Bovada gives real deal, legit bonuses. That's real money. And people were complaining about the rollover. A five times rollover is nothing. I do a five times rollover within a week or two, not even to a week, a week and a half. And if you can't hit a five times rollover, um, then you're really not even betting on sports. I mean, you're just sitting on your money. So I don't understand what the issue is for that with one or two people that said that for the most part, you guys all agree Bavada's the real deal. And um, again, I don't I don't work with them. And uh, if you guys have any legit comments on why, or, or if you like a, another sports book, let me know so I could learn and I'll hop on that other sports book if, if they are better. But Bavada, 24 seven customer phone service. Uh, I love the setup on the website. Everything is done so professional, clean and neat. And uh, I've been just pulling money off that website for years so i love them because i've been winning off them but uh some of you guys maybe had a bad experience you lost some money and uh you, you don't really have a good taste in your mouth of bovada i don't know elaborate elaborate below but if you're looking to sign up hit me up and uh, let me send you my referral link i will answer any questions about this website i'll explain to you guys how everything works it's the most transparent and easy website to use the withdrawals are super easy they have this thing called match pay where it's so easy you match up with somebody and they can pay you through venmo cash app all that stuff and then meanwhile you get the money right to your venmo cash app and then they get your money as they deposit it's, it sounds a little complicated it's super easy you can pull out through bitcoin all that stuff they'll send you a check to your house they do it all so um, if you're looking for a new sports book, reach out to me. If you sign up, I'm giving you guys some free plays as well. If you sign up through my referral link. So that offer is there for you guys. This is a great card to sign up for. Let, let's start getting things moving here. Let's make some money this week. It doesn't get more prestigious than this. We're talking the UFC heavyweight champion of the world. I like to refer to that man as the baddest man on the planet. Right now, it's pretty much Francis Ngannou. Um... I mean, some people might be able to make an argument. You know, Stipe and Francis are one and one Stipe has uh, a more lengthy uh, resume. And, you know, I would love to have seen a rematch in that fight, but we don't see that right now. Or we're not going to be seeing that right now. Uh, Stipe, I do believe if he was able to avoid that big shot and not get involved in a firefight, he could have did something similar that he did in the first fight. Uh, but that's not the case. So right now, Francis Ngannou who's the baddest man on the planet. Cyril Gaon actually has a chance now to claim the, that, that title. And uh, I am super excited for this fight. Um, this is, without a doubt, one of the highest caliber matchups in the heavyweight division that has ever taken place. We all know the story. These guys, they have a little bit of bad blood. They used to train together. Francis... You know, giving these guys the cold shoulder nowadays. Um, I mean, where do I start? Do you guys want to talk? Should we start talking about this fight uh, in regards to uh, a technical standpoint? Should we talk about that bad blood? Um, you know, Francis Ngannou. I don't know how to feel about this guy. You know, he comes off as a really nice guy, but then there's also an element to him where he's kind of cocky and he seems like the stardom is starting to get to him. Uh, he has already said that he will not be fighting in the UFC anymore after this fight. Um, he wants more money. I don't really have a problem with that. I think that's a, that's a smart move because he could be also bluffing and it could just be helping for negotiations. Um, so I don't have an issue there. I don't know really what was going on with him giving the cold shoulder to his old team. It seems like he's more on the... the uh, the, the bad end of the stick there. I feel like the other guys seem like they're all cool dudes in interviews. And it seems like Francis is a guy that's starting to get this, this, um, this persona where he's kind of a bad guy to be quite honest. Uh, but I don't really have an issue with that. I kind of like guys like that. Anyway, he's in this game to become the best and, and to destroy everybody. And there's nothing wrong with that. So, um, just want to brush upon that real quick. We know Francis Ngannou has quite possibly the, the most devastating power that we've ever seen in MMA period. Uh, so we do know if he touches Cyril Gaon that he's putting Cyril's lights out. Uh, he's putting anybody's lights out, period. Um, 
Now, this is a very intriguing matchup because Cyril Gaon, in my opinion, has showcased some of the best striking defense that I've ever seen in the heavyweight division. I mean, this guy is so cerebral in there. He's so technical. He's not really looking to engage in a firefight with you. He's looking to stick and move. He's always looking to be at distance. Uh, I mean, he is a, a true technician uh, with his stand-up. And he's a guy that has shown flashes with his grappling as well. Uh, I mean, this is this is a guy that's pulled off a heel hook. It, it, granted, it was against Dante Mays, but he still has shown that he's working on different elements of his game. I think he's a very cerebral and intelligent fighter. Uh, that's what I get from this guy. Um, I mean, this is a heavyweight that moves like he's a middleweight. I mean, this guy is an absolute pleasure to watch. He's been uh, bringing in money for, for me nonstop. So, I mean, I, obviously, I have a lot of uh, respect for him from that standpoint. Uh, you see him over here with Amavov or Nasiruddin Amavov, uh, the the uh, technical French fighter as well. And um, you know this this is a very very intriguing matchup. Uh, and there's different elements to this fight, right? They've already trained together. I think that favors Cyril Gaon a little bit more so, uh, where where he kind of has a little bit of experience. Uh, how to how to avoid that big shot from Francis? He's seen he's seen that movement. He's seen uh, Francis's his technique or whatnot. That the power punch coming at him, so he kind of ha has seen it before, and it benefits him more so to avoid that big punch. Where Francis, he might have seen Cyril Gain's style, but he's not going to be able to really. Uh, avoid that in my opinion when they go at it for a long time Cyril's going to be the guy that's out voluming him and, and landing more shots all the rumors said that Cyril Gagne used to pick Francis apart there's also a rumor that Francis dropped Cyril uh, in practice before I don't know if you guys heard that interview um, or that, that, that story that came out and I believe it and again Francis is going to have the power edge here no question about it uh, but Cyril is going to have the the technical advantage and i think there's an x factor here as well that i want to talk about i think that cyril gone is going to be the guy that's going to have better cardio i think he's a more professional and complete fighter i think if this fight um starts to go into those later rounds i think that cyril gone is going to be the guy that's going to be quicker and and more fresh and i expect him maybe to sneak in a takedown maybe get francis down um do something similar that we saw Stipe Miocic do to, to Francis Ngannou. We really haven't seen Francis prove that that he has fixed any of those holes in his game in regards to getting dragged into the deep waters. All he's been doing is really what? Knocking guys out early, right? Um, I mean, let's take a look at what he's done since that that loss to, to uh, Stipe. Uh, the Derek Lewis fight was horrible. Three, look at this, first round, first round, first round, second round knockout. And in that second fight with Stipe, Things were a little bit slow in the first round, and yeah, and he caught that knockout right in the beginning of the second round. As far as I'm concerned, that was another early victory where he really didn't get to prove he could be fresh in those those later exchanges in the fight as the fight um, started to to really brew. Um, and I favor Cyril Gaon to be the guy that, as the fight's taking place and he avoids that knockout and Francis loses a little bit of that power or gets a little bit sloppy with those wild shots and he can see them coming and he avoids them, I see Cyril Gaon picking him apart a little more so. And um, I favor I favor Gaon there too. I think there's a lot more things that favor Gaon, whereas with Francis and Gano, you just have that big power element. If he, if he touches him, he's putting him out and Francis is probably going to come like a steamroller right, uh, right towards the beginning of that first round and try to get the knockout. And if he doesn't get that finish in the first round or towards the beginning of the second round, uh, the odds on him, in my in my opinion, are going to sig significantly diminish. Uh, champion versus champion in this fight. Who do you guys have? I really want to know. Who do you guys have in this fight? Please comment below. I'm taking Cyril Gaon. We're going to take a look at the live line now. Um, Cyril Gaon right around a minus 150, 45 to a minus 155 for the most part most part um so people are favoring the technician over the the power puncher in francis Ngannou. i'm curious to see how this line moves i think we might see a little bit of a comeback on francis as the fight gets closer he has a big name in the game he's starting to become a real star in the sport we're going to see him featured on the new in the new jackass movie 3.3 million followers um compared to uh cyril's I don't even know if Cyril broke a million. We're talking about a half a million followers. I mean, Francis is a star in the game. Expect some some big things to come in the future with Francis. He's going to have some big negotiations. Who knows what's going to happen? His contract is up after this fight. Uh, you could potentially see him in a big boxing match. Would love to see him versus Tyson Fury. Uh, you guys know I believe Tyson Fury would absolutely pick him apart, uh, but would love to see it nonetheless. And I am a fan of both these guys. I admire everything they bring to the table. I cannot wait for this fight. I am picking Cyril Gaon to win the fight. I think that that his striking defense will be enough to avoid that big shot. And then he'll take over the fight and pick Francis apart. And it's going to be a sight to see.
All right, guys, it's that time. We're wrapping up. I want to throw a little message at you guys, as I always like to do. I think this one's an important one, especially as the year just begins uh, as far as uh, a, a new year and, and sports betting for us, 2022. Um, I want to make sure you guys are, are being smart with your bankroll management. And as far as if you're drinking alcohol and you're betting or you're just getting reckless, if you have a loss and then you're chasing your money, you guys listen to me real quick. You got to be grounded with your bets, man. You, you can't get emotional. You can't chase your bets and you can't get too drunk and start throwing out bets recklessly. I, I actually did it a little bit this past weekend in regards to, excuse me, in regards to betting on sports in general, not just MMA, but with the NFL playoffs, uh, I lost some money on the Cowboys. Not going to lie to you guys. You guys can see that there. I posted it in my story. It's also uh, on my Instagram, Sports Betting Weekly. I posted that 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 uh, picture there. And I'll be posting a lot of my overall sports bets. And you guys, I'll have the channel below too. Go, fo go follow me. Subscribe to that channel. I'm always going to be putting out at least one video per week with a free bet. Um, but again, when you take a small loss, you go back to the drawing board. And, and you you guys, you have to understand that's what you got to do, man. Hear my voice in your head, man. When, you, when you're drunk and you're chasing a bet because... It will very, very quickly turn into a very, very ugly time for you. And you'll wake up sick sick to your stomach in the middle of the night. You'll wake up very depressed the next day when you blew five, ten thousand dollars in a night or whatever it is for you. If you blew five hundred bucks, you know, you're not gonna feel good about it, depending on what you're working with. Remember, man, stay if you stay grounded. That's the, that's the biggest edge you could have in the sports betting game. You have to stay grounded. It's, you know, plant your feet in the ground. Stick to the plays where you have the edge you feel confident with, and you will slowly make some money, and you'll put some money in your pocket. You get crazy, you're going to get swallowed up. If you're throwing out aimless bets, just hoping that you can catch something to, to make up for some losses, you're going to get eaten alive, okay? And I've been there plenty of times. I've been a big sports better for over a decade, for a long, long time, uh, way over a decade now. And uh, I have very... Uh, or I have a good amount of experience with this. I know the feeling. It sucks. I don't want you any. I don't want any of you guys feeling like this, um, as well as well as me. And uh, I've been there. So just this upcoming year, let's be grounded with our bets. Stay structured. Don't be stupid, because uh, you will regret it, man. All right, guys. That's gonna be my message here. Let's have a great time leading into this big card, UFC 270. Catch me on Instagram, MMA Fortune Teller underscore. I will be posting stuff all week. I'll be in the story. I might even do a live video leading up to this card or something like that, but it's the best way to stay in contact with me. If you're interested in working with me, you guys know I'm always available. Shoot me an email, all that. It's all below, and I would love to work with you guys. I'll give you my pricing. All right, guys. Ah, whew, what an episode, all right? Thank you guys for, for, for those of you guys that have stayed with me all throughout this video. Appreciate you guys the most. Signing out. Teller. The... MMA fortune, MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller.